Right, well, uh, I'm a member of the IP bar, and you've got an IP solicitor in Michael Strain just behind you. In fact, you've got lots of IP solicitors. Now, um, my original instructions were to talk about... Um, do you, can you move this to the next slide? Yeah. To uh, talk about IP enforcement in the UK. But we isn't such a thing as UK law. We uh, are a, a unitary jurisdiction, um, having devolved some of our administrative and legislative responsibilities to Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we have three legal districts, um, England and Wales being by far the largest, Scotland being very different from uh, the law of England, it's uh, a hybrid between uh, the law of the continent and the law of the common law, and Northern Ireland, which is uh, more or less like our law, but there are differences, and um, some of these differences are very, very, very... Um, basic. Um, the basic word for the complainant in England is a claimant. Uh, the basic word in Scotland is a pursuer. The basic word in Northern Ireland is, uh, is a plaintiff. So I'm going to be talking about what I really know about, and that's um, um, UK law, being uh, a member of the Bar of England and Wales. Having said that, on the 25th of April, um, I'm going to be appearing in front of uh, the uh, hearing officer in Glasgow in a patent matter, in an entitlement matter. So uh, in the patent office, we do have uh, uh, nationwide jurisdiction. But uh, that's rare. That'll be the first time I've ever actually practiced outside uh, England and Wales in, um, in the United Kingdom. Now, as I say, the rest of the discussion will be on uh, um, uh, the system that applies here. And one big difference between uh, Germany and uh, England and Wales is that everything is very centralised. We have one senior court, or one set of senior courts, um, the Court of Appeal, which is, uh, I think, what uh, Holger would describe as a court of second instance, and the uh, um, High Court, which uh, is divided into three divisions, really functionally. And the division which deals with intellectual property is called the Chancery Division, there's a historical reason. It was used to be run by chancellors who were churchmen. Originally, had very different uh, um, procedure, but uh, over the last 150 years, and more particularly since 1999, the procedures have been uh, converging. There's one, we don't have a code of civil procedure, as they do in Germany, as they do in France, but we do have a codification of the rules of, of the civil courts, which are called the civil procedure rules, which are divided into a number of... Uh, parts and practice directions, and they're supplemented by court guides. And the rules which govern IP claims almost exclusively are Part 63 and the Part 63 practice direction. So when I refer to um, that uh, practice direction and that rule, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, nearly, as I say, nearly all intellectual property cases are dealt with in the Chancery Division, and there are within the Chancery Division two specialised courts. Um, there's a patents court, which looks up to patents from registered designs. Registered designs can be relevant in fashion. Um, and then there's uh, the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court, which uh, used to be called the Patents County Court until uh, just over a year ago. It uh, was supposed to be part one of a series of uh, county courts all over the country, but there was only one established. It was known as the Patents County Court. It sat initially somewhere in North London. Eventually it moved down to, um, uh, to Regent's Park, and it now has been integrated in the High Court. It's in the, the, the Rolls Building. Um, it's uh, usually referred to by its uh, initials as IPEC. And IPEC is the tribunal which uh, is for most fashion cases, or most trademark cases, I would say most cases, except for very big ones, the appropriate jurisdiction. Some years ago, um, we, uh, um, the Intellectual Property Advisory Committee, um, which was a group of IP experts, did a comparison of the cost of litigation in Germany, France, the Netherlands, the United States and the UK. And guess what? The most expensive places to sue in were the United States and the UK. But particularly the UK, because in the, um, the United States, uh, lawyers are allowed to take uh, um, instructions on contingency fee basis, which we've never been allowed to do. And you can get costs. And so for a poor old intellectual property, and going to court was a very, very daunting thing. Now, 
um, we realised we were losing work to people like Holger in Germany and to the Dutch and uh, to others, and we thought we'd better do something about trying to uh, improve the uh, cost of litigation. And so we introduced this uh, um, jurisdiction for claims of less than £500,000 that can be tried in no more than two days. Now, I should explain that unlike Germany and France, and one reason why it's so expensive is that we have trials. We don't have a, a process, as it were, over the years, over, over the period of time. We have one hearing where witnesses are cross-examined, where counsel um, submit, make arguments of law to a judge, um, where there are uh, um, uh, written and oral submissions, and everything's done in a big bang. Traditionally, in intellectual property, that could take at least a week and it could take longer. One of the things about uh, IPEC is that it, um, is, the trial is restricted to two days. <coughs> and I should also say that um, very recently, IPEC has introduced uh, um, the, 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 a small claims track which um, allows uh, for claims for anything except patents and registered designs and uh, I think plant varieties and uh, chip topographies of claims of less than £10,000. It's a very, very, very quick, very acceler a very speedy process, a very quick process, um, very informal process. Um, four district judges um, sit in for, uh, to deal with these cases for hearings, and I did one once about a, a year ago, they are very informal. They take no more than a, um, half a day to, to dispose of, and that's both disposing of liability and damages. And, uh, well, quite a lot of the cases, a Holger was saying that you don't really worry too much about damages, you want your injunction. Well, most of the claims I've had in the 30 years I've been practicing intellectual property law have been cases where what people want are the injunctions. They want the injunctions quickly and they want uh, a, a very, very little risk. I practiced most of my career in the Northern Circuit, where I was going off to the district to, to, in, to the front of the Vice Chancellor of the County Palatine of Lancaster or to uh, uh, his deputies, and we spent as much as we would have spent in London for basically getting an injunction and uh, then got the, the order for an inquiry to damages, but nobody really wanted it. The small claims track will actually deal with an awful lot of cases in practice, for, particularly for the small businesses. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details about this. This is, uh, this is technical and we're rather running short of time. Um, uh, I will say this about how our procedure works. In, in most intellectual property cases, in most chancery cases, there are two processes uh, which take about a year each. The first is to decide liability, that is to say whether a defendant really has infringed, and the next is to decide um, the uh, um, damages or, if you uh, um, prefer, um, uh, an account of profits, that's to say you get him to uh, uh, cough up his ill-gotten gains. I might say that in my career at the bar, I've only had a handful of inquiries or um, accounts of profits, but that's how it's supposed to, that's how it is in theory in the Chancellor Division. You have liability decided first, then you have damages. That doesn't mean to say that because people don't go to inquiry, they don't um, get compensation at the end of the day, but it's very, very often done by negotiation. Once you have a trial, once you've spent the very large amounts of money on getting to trial, getting your final injunction, nobody has much of an appetite for anything else, and um, so there's uh, oft often just simply settlement negotiations at that stage. Right, okay. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about why it's expensive in this country, and that is that, um, and I have touched upon it um, uh, already, and that is that uh, um, unlike the situation in uh, most continental jurisdictions, it's down to the parties to decide what evidence they want to hear, what issues they want to try, what to be tried, um, what uh, witnesses are going to be called. As I understand it, and I have a little experience of that because... Uh, 30 years ago, I was legal advisor to Visa International, and I had to look after um, uh, brand enforcement cases in uh, the UK and in the rest of Europe, and indeed North Africa and the Middle East. And one big difference I noticed was that uh, um, in the continent, it's down to the court to decide these issues. 
and uh, the actual hearing is very, very, very quick. His Honour, um, Judge Feisch, who used to sit in the predecessor of IPEC and speaks excellent French, once went over to uh, Paris um, to sit in the equivalent uh, court, and uh, he asked, do you think it would be possible if, we manage, if we'll get a trial uh, of an intellectual property case today? And the judge said, oh, certainly, we'll get two. We'll get one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and it'll all be done and dusted by the afternoon. And that, to, an English, to English ears, is incredible. As I say, even uh, in IPEC, it's, uh, it is down to one or two days. So, but the way, reason they can do it in the continent is that it is down very much to um, the judge to decide the issues that are going to be heard, the evidence that's going to be heard, and the, uh, um, uh, and the documentation which is going to be, uh, to be considered. So, um, going, uh, and I've taken this uh, um, largely from Holger's slides as a model, uh, he talked about a cease and desist uh, stage. Um, we used to have something called letters bef a letter, uh, a, um, letter before action, which were very much like cease and desist letters. Um, more recently, uh, in 1999, when we introduced the civil procedure um, uh, rules, um, we had an approach that only in the most urgent cases, really when you're dealing with somebody rather more dishonest, do you actually try to have recourse to going for uh, injunctive procedures and some of the more... Uh, um, draconian things such as uh, the Anton Pillar or search order, which I'll deal with later. In this um, jurisdiction, and I think it's because litigation is so expensive, um, we tend to do have uh, concentrate on a, a, a pre-action procedure, which in many cases does settle the case without need to uh, recourse to to courts at all. Um, the first is uh, the uh, uh, stage where the parties. Uh, um, exchange their uh, uh, positions. You uh, write to your uh, opposite party, you send a letter before claim, and it says in the um, uh, pre-action protocol, or sorry, pre-action practice direction, that a letter before claim should not be considered the start of proceedings. It's uh, to give the other side an opportunity to know what the other, what, what the claimant's case is, and if necessary, to challenge it, and then possibly having defined the issues, then to uh, have discussion. And in my experience, that often does work. Um, letter before claim, um, does, uh, there's, there are certain things which the practice direction says have to go in it. And about 10 years ago, a committee of uh, lawyers, the patent, patent agents, uh, the Intellectual Property Office, chaired by Mr. Skrine, actually produced something which I find personally very, very useful, which is um, a code of uh, practice of pre-action conduct in intellectual property cases. And uh, when a solicitor, and I act for solicit really large, very largely very small firms in the north of England, when a solicitor um, is thinking about suing, I warn him about threats actions, which is again something you won't necessarily hear of in outside England and Wales, or outside the United Kingdom. I warn him that he himself uh, is walking on eggshells, and I suggest that he should, in his letter before claim, um, put not just simply the four or five uh, headings which are in the practice direction, but also what's the, the, the contents that are in um, the uh, code of practice of pre-action conduct. That I think is very, very helpful. If there is no um, negotiation and settlement through negotiation, um, the, the may be uh, a, a referral to an arbitrator, a mediator, the patent office, the intellectual property office, offers a very, very inexpensive uh, um, procedure for a mediation service. And again, I've done, used that several times, and it works. I see you're looking nervous, so I shall hurry. Um, if that doesn't work, then this will be the issue of uh, pleadings, statements of case, um, and uh, then we have uh, um, that, that is uh, really to define the issues. Um, then we go uh, through uh, the process of disclosure. That's each side um, declares what documents are available. There's an exchange of witness statements and experts' reports. Every party gets ready. We have a trial. Before the trial, counsel have to exchange. Uh, um, uh, 
skeleton arguments which set out in about uh, half a dozen pages. If, you, if it's more than 12 10 pages, you tend to get judicial dispro disapproval. Um, and uh, you uh, um, then have the hearing where uh, you, um, the, the claimant opens his case with an outline. Um, he calls his witnesses. The witnesses are cross-examined by the other side. The defendant then makes his submissions. The claimant answers those submissions. And in uh, the uh, Intellectual Property Enterprise Court, there's usually refer reverse reserve judgment, where the judgment is uh, presented about a month later. Sometimes it's done um, more quickly. Um, IPEC streams lines that position even more. Um, after the exchange of pleadings, the court calls, a, or rather the um, claimant or is supposed to call a case management conference, and there the court decides what issues it wants uh, to concentrate on. Well, parties decide it, really. They try to agree it, but it's uh, down to the judge's approval. And what evidence is going to be uh, um, called? The first uh, stage is where the judge fixes the date for the trial and uh, the evidence um, to be called. And as I say, um, the parties work to a very strict timetable. If you get it wrong, you get into all sorts of... Uh, trouble. You might well have to be paying costs to somebody. Um, and uh, then, as I say, um, about a year after the writ is issued, the claim form is issued, you get, usually get a judgment. A um, bit more than that, maybe 14 months, 16 months, I would say. Um, then, if you want to get uh, damages, you go for an, an inquiry of damages, or you go for uh, an account of profits. Small claims track, much simpler, is dealt with rather like as in France in an afternoon. There's a judge called Janet Lambert, no relation, but everybody thinks I'm she. <laughs> uh, um, she does this very, very efficiently. She's very, very efficient. She wasn't an IP practitioner, but she really has learnt her stuff. So I shall just simply go um, through um, some of the um, differences. Um, as I say, a trial usually takes, and, and a trial usually um, takes place in London, though the courts will come to um, the provinces for uh, um, a hearing if uh, it's in the convenience of a if it's for the convenience of the parties. That has only happened to me twice. I always ask for it when I'm against a London uh, claimant. I tend to act for infringers, by the way, not for the big brands, uh, although, of course, I do I sometimes act for big brands, and I will always be very happy to ins accept instructions from big brands. But I tend, as I say, uh, to act for, uh, for infringers, sort of defendants, and, uh, and so on. And uh, whenever I find myself uh, up against uh, someone in IPEC or indeed in the, the uh, Patents Court Intellectual Property List, I try to get them to the uh, judge to sit in Manchester or Leeds. And uh, sometimes I even get it, but, uh, um, yeah, but, but uh, there's always a little bit of an argument about that. Um, but, it's, uh, but, but sometimes it, um, it does actually save costs and it saves time. Um, uh, as I said, I prefer to be a statement by IPEC who made the comparison. This is the difference. Um, this was 2003, one million pounds in a patents court for a claim. This is patent infringement. Trademark and passing off can be a lot more, because especially passing off, because um, you have to prove, uh, first of all, goodwill, then you've got to prove misrepresentation, and although damages flow from that, you've actually got to show it is effective um, uh, misrepresentation. So it could have been even more than a million pounds. Fine when we had legal aid, but we haven't had that since 1999. So the poor blighters have to pay for it themselves. And uh, small companies just can't do that, which means that they are bullied quite a lot by uh, well-funded claimers, whether their cases are justified or not. United States, similarly, two to four million dollars in 2003. But, um, own, but, but in the United States, uh, costs don't usually follow the event of... Uh, in, in other words, you can't get attorney's fees, counsel's fees um, from, uh, uh, from a defendant in the United States. But look what, the diff what they found. The average case for a patent infringement case in France was 50,000 euros. Germany, it was, was um, uh, uh, 50,000 euros. The Netherlands, 10 to 40,000 euros. So that was a big, big difference. So I think I have... Um, pretty well covered it, I think. Oh, I 
did say we have no such thing as a cease and desist letter. Um, that's partially true, but we do have the uh, um, pre. We do, we do have the letter before claim, um, and as I said, that is to to. Um, uh, to, to, to clarify the issues so that they can actually facilitate negotiation. Um, a couple of things about injunctions. One big difference between injunctions in this country and injunctions in the continent is that the uh, sanction for disobedience is committal to prison or to fine or some other penalty. There is no equivalent of the estrand. None of this non business of uh, 5,000 or 10,000 euros we do have things like, uh, I think, contractual uh, uh, sanctions in England. We call it simply undertakings to the court. They have the same effect of, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, an, in, as, as um, an injunction. Um, but uh, um, we, I think this is a case where Germany and England call these things by different names, but they have the same sort of effect. But that's one big difference. Injunctions are not easy to get in this country. Um, you have to pay uh, uh, the costs if you lose. Um, uh, they normally take, I mean, and it's, it's really is impractical to really try and get them in IPEC, the, the small, the, um, uh, the, the court which uh, for claims under £500,000, and then for claims of £10,000 are not available at all until the, uh, the final hearing. But the idea of an injunction is to um, uh, more or less say things uh, um, until the matter comes to trial, to keep the status quo. For 1999, they were commonplace. Even uh, search orders or uh, Anton Pillars were fairly commonplace. Uh, since uh, 1999, uh, they become much rarer because the losing pay party, which might well be the claimant, has to pay the costs of the application, which can be many thousands of pounds, uh, could be as much as uh, 50, 60, even 100,000 pounds if it's in the general list uh, within 14 days of the decision. And uh, they do um, deter. And incidentally, unlike Germany, we don't have statutory fees um, for costs. Costs are assessed on uh, by um, a, a judicial official called a cost judge. So um, one important thing to um, um, big dif one very big difference between our system and other countries is that the claimant has to give a promise to compensate the defendant if the turns out at the end of the day that the injunction shouldn't have been granted. That may be because the claimant loses and the defendant wins, but it can even be when the claimant wins, but it still shouldn't have got an interim injunction for whatever reason. And that itself is very much a uh, um, uh, um, a dampener on things. So you really would have to be pretty sure of your ground before you go to, uh, before you apply for it. Um, the court has power to grant special interim injunctions called search orders, and I think those exist in France. I forget now. I think um, exactly. yes, exactly. Uh, I seem to remember those. Um, the big difference is that here you have to get a. Um, a supervisory solicitor who's appointed by the court to uh, um, see fair play. And uh, it can't be any old solicitor. It's got to be a solicitor who's done a lot of these things before, which again puts the price fees up. You've got to uh, make, when you're applying for these injunctions, you've got to make full and frank disclosure uh, because you're in the absence of defendant. So you have to put the points which a defendant would have put had he been there. And if you don't do that, then the injunction can be set aside uh, on the return day in just a few days' time. But it can do, it does have that power to allow uh, entry into the premises of the defendant to look for documents, computer records, on safeguards, look for any infringing products, take copies of those. And you'll do that if you think the defendant is so dishonest that he's going to, uh, um, to uh, hide or destroy stuff. We also have um, a, a remedy called um, a freezing injunction if you think the defendant is uh, going to um, uh, dispose of all his assets so at the end of the day there's no costs to be obtained and there are no damages. Um, the small claims track of IPEC can grant injunctions at the end of a hearing but it's not no power to make preliminary injunctions. So I think that is... Uh, oh... I think I'll just say what happens in practice because of the cost. Most cases are settled by negotiation, mediation, preferably before uh, action starts and long, a long time before the trial. Um, 
piracy, counterfeiting, and since uh, 1st of October, um, deliberate copy of registered designs become an offence. So more and more people are using criminal sanctions, and they go to people like Alex over here, who's uh, an expert in that. Uh, IPO, our patent office, and um, trading stamps office, our IP um, a crime, a unit, a crime unit. And uh, often there are private prosecutions brought. And that, ladies and gentlemen, eventually is that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane. I think because we're running a bit short.